one. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending where you are. And welcome to the fifth webinar of the uh, Standing Committee for Gender Equality in Science. My name is Catherine Jamy. I'm a researcher at the French CNRS, and I'm the chair of the Standing Committee for uh, Gender Equality in Science. The acronym is SCGES. SCGES is an independent committee formed in 2020 by nine international scientific organizations, mostly full members of the International Science Council. These founding partners had worked together on the ISC supported project entitled A Global Approach to the Gender Gap in Mathematical Computing and Natural Sciences, how to measure it, how to reduce it. This project became known as the Gender Gap in Science Project. Today, SCGES has 20 partners, which are ISC International Union members. They represent millions of scientists brought together across disciplines to promote gender equality in science. The aim of SCGES is to ensure liaison amongst international scientific unions to foster gender equality and the implementation of recommendations of the Gender Gap in Science project, especially in the scientific communities that the unions represent. SDGES has also issued recommendations to safeguard gender equality in science in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. SCGES actively cooperates with policymakers and international organizations, first and foremost ISC, for the promotion of gender equality in science. In our work, we strive to take into account the diversity of the situations of women around the world and across disciplines, and to explore good practices. For our fifth webinar, the International Union for Pure and Applied Chemistry, IUPAP, who is one of our founding partners, is sharing with us the initiatives they have developed to actively foster gender equality in chemistry. And um, I'm delighted to give the floor to Mark Cheza, former IUPAP president, who will chair this session. Thank you, Catherine. I'm Mark Sessa, treasurer of the SCGES, a member of the IUPAC Standing Committee on Ethics, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and a former president of IUPAC. IUPAC is one of the founding partner organizations of the SCGES. IUPAC entered its second century in 2019 with forward-looking goals, including initiatives to create a more diverse and inclusive chemistry community. This webinar will offer an overview with a focus on gender issues in the chemical sciences. IUPAC has been working to improve gender equality within the union, among its member organizations, and in the global chemistry enterprise. The title of today's webinar is Moving Ahead on Gender Equality, a Chemistry Perspective. Three talks will be presented today that we hope, and we hope that their presentations, these presentations will generate ideas among our listeners today and foster a lively discussion. The three talks will be presented together and then we will take questions afterwards. Please enter your questions into the YouTube chat function. A reminder that attendees will be muted and cameras will be off during the webinar, except for the speaker. Our first talk today will be presented by Dr. Laura McConnell. Laura is a Bayer Science Fellow in the Regulatory Scientific Affairs Team in Bayer Crop Science. Her role is on university and scientific society engagement. She is the co-chair of the IEPAC Global Women's Breakfast and a member of the IEPAC Executive Committee. Her expertise is in analytical and environmental chemistry. The title of her talk is Building a Global Network. Well, thank you so much, Mark, for that introduction. And I'm incredibly honored to be with you today as a representative of IUPAC 
an organization that for more than 100 years has provided fundamental knowledge and tools that allow for the advancement of science. We know that chemistry is one of the basic sciences that allows us to understand our planet. Advances in the chemical sciences will be key to achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And chemists must be able to work in multidisciplinary teams to achieve the kind of rapid progress that is needed to pull us back from exceeding our planetary boundaries. Historically, chemistry has been a largely male dominated profession, but women have made critically important contributions to the field. Women scientists often don't take time to celebrate their successes and contributions. And this was the original idea behind what is now called the IUPAC Global Women, Women's Breakfast Series. So what was the origin of the IUPAC Global Women's Breakfast. The first GWB was created by our own Professor Mary Garson, who's here with us today, um, as part of the International Year of Chemistry that was celebrated in 2011. The idea was to celebrate the achievements of women in chemistry with Mary Curie as a focal point. But how? How to organize such a celebration on a global scale? Mary was inspired by the idea that women often get together over breakfast to network. And this led to the global breakfast concept of individually organized events linked together. And groups were encouraged to reach out to each other on the day of the breakfast, thereby joining together in celebration. And you can see one of the breakfasts that were held in um, Paraguay back in 2011. So after that, the Global Breakfast was uh, rebooted or, or resurrected, if you will, in 2019 during the um, International Year of the Periodic Table, which was also a celebration of the IUPAC centenary in 2019. And so in this case, we, uh, as IUPAC, provided a platform for organizers to uh, register their events on a global map and plan uh, events according to what their needs were from a local perspective, but then feel part of this uh, global network. That year in 2019, we had 203 events in 50 countries and more than 10,000 people uh, participating. You can see some of the photos that were taken uh, during that event. And what was wonderful was to see all the activity on social media and also that the, these uh, different groups connected with each other and uh, really helped with uh, the professional development of the women involved uh, in these events. That year in 2019, the IUPAC had their uh, General Assembly and World Chemistry Congress in Paris. And you can see Mary and I celebrating uh, a successful uh, uh, IUPAC centenary and also uh, a picture from the, uh, the celebration event that was held. And at that event, we announced that um, the GWB was, would become an annual event. And so just to uh, give you an idea of the main goals of the Global Women's Breakfast, and again, to really celebrate women in science, take that moment in time, uh, that day to really celebrate, uh, to take the opportunity to strengthen and expand a global network, uh, to try to close the gender gap in science. Um, one of the things that's always wonderful is that uh, these events inspire uh, younger scientists and, uh, and encourage them to pursue uh, careers in STEM, and then also to support professional development and leadership development. 
One of the other really nice things about holding the Global Breakfast in February, as we always do, is that we can um, partner and focus on the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. And, uh, and so there's always a lot of activity online uh, around this day. And so we usually try to schedule the GWB within a few days of, of February 11th. And just to give you a little data, since this is a science related talk, you can see that uh, starting in 2011, we had 100 events um, with 40 countries and around 5,000 participants. And you can see each time that we've held the global breakfast, the numbers have increased the number of countries and also the number of events. So who attends the global breakfast uh, events? Largely it's university and faculty, uh, university students and faculty, but we do have a, a industry scientists uh, some companies like, like Bayer uh, use the Global Breakfast as a way to connect uh, women from all different uh, cities where they have affiliates or, or facilities, and, um, and then also to feel like they're part of the, that global network. But we have uh, government scientists, high school uh, teachers that hold events, and uh, nonprofit organizations, and uh, it, it becomes a, a really interesting mix. So if we back up, what actually happens during the global breakfast or the day of the global breakfast? And so the focal point is really the global map that's created on the IUPAC website. So if you go to iupac.org GWB, you can see this year's uh, uh, global map for 2023. This is one I'm showing here that was in 2020. And what happens because of the way the time zones are, the first events happen in New Zealand. So they're always the first to hold their breakfast. And then you start to see these uh, hearts change color as each event begins. And um, throughout about 20 hours, you see uh, the breakfast events uh, starting around the globe and sort of making a wave around the world. And so it's very inspiring. You, you start seeing a transition from uh, New Zealand to Australia, to Asia, then into Europe and Africa, and then uh, into the uh, Southern, uh, to South America and, and North America, usually the final event is in Hawaii. And all of the groups are encouraged to post pictures and share flyers. Um, that's one of the beautiful things about the Global Breakfast is uh, it's each event is unique and it brings the personality and the culture of um, the team that uh, develops it. And it gives an opportunity for so many uh, young scientists, especially to have more visibility within their organization. And uh, each, it, because we're having it each year now, it becomes something they can um, plan towards and uh, really try to get some mileage out of um, the event for their organization. <clears throat> so what happened this year in 2022? So in 2022, we had over 400 events, a new record, um, more than uh, 30,000 people around the world, uh, 78 countries involved, and 12 first-time countries. So it was incredibly exciting to see that. And here on this map, you can see the 12 countries that were first-time um, participants. And we're hoping in 2023, we have um, many more first time countries. A little bit more as far as statistics, the average event uh, includes 80 people, median around 50 people. So sometimes these are, are quite large, but uh, you can have very small events as well. You know, five to 10 people is just fine. 
Uh, it doesn't have to be a major uh, event to be meaningful. Uh, this year in 2022, about half the events were virtual, a quarter in person and another quarter in, as a hybrid event. Um, sometimes, for example, chemical societies will, um, will organize events at multiple locations where they maybe start out as a joint um, virtual program and then break out into the different uh, locations so that they can have more of in-person experience. Uh, so it's really been incredible to watch how different organizations have really taken ownership of their GWB events and, um, and made them very impactful. So speaking of impact, what has been the impact so far? So we use the, uh, a survey that we do at the end of each breakfast uh, where we ask organizers to give us um, more information about what they did during their event. And also we ask them questions about whether the global breakfast has led to, for example, increased attention to diversity issues. And about 65% of the organizers indicated that they did uh, see an increased attention to diversity issues in their organization. Also that it um, led to new connections within their organization even. Also externally uh, that they provided leadership development opportunities for women and also more open discussions. I think that's really critical. Uh, sometimes just having an event like this it makes people think, stop and think, and to, to have uh, really meaningful conversations and sometimes drawing in um, the leadership of an organization uh, into uh, a more active dialogue. And uh, also sometimes this led to the formation of new groups in support of diversity in science. So what's coming up in 2023? We're always looking towards the next year, what's gonna happen. Um, so in 2023, the Global Breakfast will be held on February 14th. And our theme is breaking barriers in science. So uh, we have a theme each year and hopefully this help gives some inspiration towards programming. And you can see here, we. We have a lot of uh, uh, scientists that have been involved with the breakfast since the beginning in 2011. And many of them serve on our organizing committee and serve as sort of resource people within their country or their region and help to um, draw in new organizers uh, to the breakfast. Uh, this year, we're excited to be part of another International Year celebration, the one called uh, Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development, IYBSSD. And you can look at the website uh, for more information. What's great uh, and timely about this International Year, it allows uh, us to expand beyond chemistry. I mean, chemistry obviously has been our focus in the past. But this year, we really want to expand and in invite scientists from across all disciplines to participate and join together and see how uh, building this network, not just among chemistry organizations, but all science organizations and how we can strengthen uh, and increase the impact uh, of this network. So. Um, just some initiatives that we have uh, planned for the next few months in support of, of the 2023 event. We're organizing some uh, Zoom speed networking events for organizers to connect with each other ahead of the breakfast day. And this is something that uh, has been requested many times. And so now technologically we can, we can make it happen. And so we have some a different date scheduled uh, leading up to the breakfast. Also, uh, we wanna 
decrease the amount of work it takes to be a first time organizer. So we've developed a detailed organizer's guide that get, can get you up and running uh, and through uh, the registration process really quickly and also um, give you some ideas about programming um, and, uh, and also, you know, make it less stressful for people to organize events. Uh, we're always improving our resources. So once you're registered as an organizer, you have access to uh, various marketing resources that you can customize for your event. And, um, and so we're trying to provide additional uh, and improve resources along those lines. And um, this year, we're also focusing on uh, improving uh, participation across all genders. So um, we want men to feel welcome at these events and we want their, their support and we need them. Uh, we need their, their help and uh, their allyship in this effort. And so um, we have uh, committees that are working on outreach and ways that we can encourage participation across all genders. So this is our current map for, for 2023 so far. We have uh, 52 events, I believe, as of today. And we expect this to start ramping up quickly. But this does give you an idea that we, we already have events that span the entire globe. And I encourage everyone who's joining today or listening to this uh, webinar to consider registering an event. It's quick and easy. It doesn't cost anything to register and it can bring a lot of great um, benefits to your organization. So again, I'll just leave you with uh, this, I encourage you to go to the website iupac.org slash GWB to find out all the details and uh, how to become uh, a GWB organizer, but also feel free to reach out to Mary or myself um, and uh, we're happy to help you give you any kind of guidance and uh, answer any questions that you may have. So now I'll um, pass it back to Mark Sesa for the next uh, presentation. Thanks very much, Laura. Our next speaker is Mary Garson. Mary is an emeritus professor of chemistry at the University of Queensland in Australia although today she is talking to us from the UK, a much more friendly time zone for the webinar. Mary has been a volunteer for IUPAC for over 20 years and currently chairs the Committee for Ethics, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Her many and significant contributions have been acknowledged by the Australian government through her appointment as a member of the Order of Australia for her services to education and to women in science. Her talk is entitled, Expanding the Role of Women in IEPAC. Thank you, Mark. And thank you to the Standing Committee for Gender Equity and Science for arranging this webinar. Now, just, just ask people to just uh, wait for a minute while I share my screen with you. And go on to presentation mode. And uh, just... All right, so um, as Mark uh, from Brisbane in Australia, but uh, currently I'm in the United Kingdom. Uh, and so I'm delighted about this because of course, it means that the time frame is, is much more pleasant than if I'd been back in Australia. So let me just move on to my first, first slide. Sorry, everybody, I don't know why this is happening. Didn't happen when we did a trial a few minutes ago. I'm going to uh, un, oh, I'm going to stop screen share and just start again. Apologies for that. I don't know why it is that when you do a test run, things work beautifully. Uh, but when you actually get to the real thing, sometimes you get little gremlins. Let me see. Okay, fine. 
now we're in business and I really hope that people can see the slide. Now, when I was starting to prepare this presentation, uh, I came across a recent report from the Australian Academy of Sciences. And in Australia, it, as in many other countries, the ratio of female to male undergraduate students studying chemistry is one to one. In other words, we have gender parity. However, in the professional workforce here in Australia, only about one quarter, the figure is 28% of the workforce is female. And it's quite a surprise to me to read this. And I wondered why. And apparently it's linked in part to the low amounts of paid parental leave, the small number of weeks that is uh, compared to other OECD countries uh, that are provided to families. And it's pleasing to report that our newly elected Australian government has made it a priority to legislate to change that and to improve that situation. Within the academic sector, about 20% of Australian chemistry professors are female. And this is quite a good big change from when I started as an academic over 30 years ago. When I joined my university, I was in fact the very first female appointed to an academic position. Now in 2022, we have five female professors of chemistry, and in addition to other academics, in total about one third of our staff are women. However, all is not rosy because recent international reports suggest that there is still significant gender inequality and that gender inequality in STEM is increasing, not decreasing. And apparently this could be in part because of assumptions that the issue has been fixed. And of course, we all know that it hasn't been fixed. So the focus for my presentation today is to tell you about the progress that IUPAC as a major scientific union has made on gender issues and the benefits that this has so far brought to chemistry and will do so into the future. IUPAC has launched a number of initiatives. We just heard about one, the Global Women's Breakfast, which will encourage the creation of a more diverse and inclusive community. So I'm going to tell you about some of the other initiatives. And I need, therefore, of course, to begin by just explaining very briefly what IUPAC is about, its people and its activities. And so please bear with me while I do that, and then we'll get back to gender equity. So as Mark said, IUPAC was founded in 1919. It's now in its second century. IUPAC has a strategic, the key parts of which are shown on the screen. And the purpose of our strategic plan is to define our unique role and our value within the chemical enterprise so that contributions can be recognized in ways that no other chemical society or professional organization could do alone. The mission statement of IUPAC, which is shown on the slide, providing objective expertise, developing tools and communication for the benefit of humankind and the world, uh, further articulates core values. And the core values that are shown, scientific excellence, communication, transparency, diversity, this is the key one that we're going to be talking about today, and ethical behavior. These behaviors, these values are practiced by all of the union's volunteers, staff and stakeholders. And so has, as has already been said today, we need a diverse community of chemists creating new knowledge and translating that into useful applications, meeting the major global challenges of today and of the future, notably addressing the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And a key message has to be that diversity is valued and is the norm. So what does IUPAC do? IUPAC is the world authority on chemical nomenclature, on, te on terminology, including, of course, most people know the naming of new elements in the periodic table, standardized methods, measurements, atomic weights, and many other critically evaluated data. IUPAC develops and maintains recommendations that create a common global chemistry community so we can all talk to each other. And it allows chemists to understand each other and to represent molecules and transformations in an easily recognizable way. Now, if you look at the slide, you'll see that uh, we've highlighted in red um, publishing. Uh, IUPAC 
publishes technical reports, journals, books, databases. It has a lot of interactive online materials on diverse topics from climate change to isotope abundance. And it has online educational activities like the periodic table challenge quiz, which is an excellent way to engage young people with the discipline of chemistry. Uh, if I move back to the second yellow wheel, sharing emerging science, one of the key things that IUPAC does is to identify each year the top 10 emerging technologies in chemistry. If I move to the right, to the green wheel, networking, IUPAC set, has set up networks. We just heard a description of one of them uh, and also uh, runs a large number of symposia and conferences. However, I want to highlight the, the uh, orange, the wheel on the right hand side, honouring, honouring scientific contributions and expertise, because I'm shortly going to be telling you about the Distinguished Women Award that IUPAC has um, in, in a couple of minutes. Um, my last introductory slide is just to help us through the conversation about the role women in leadership has played in IUPAC. There are eight technical divisions, and the names of those are listed there. And each division has a number of representatives, three categories, titular members, associate members, and national representative. So each division will have a total of about 20, between 20 and 26 uh, representatives who are elected each two years. And uh, there is geographical representation amongst this membership. That is very important. We have some committees which look at interdisciplinary areas, including chemical education, green, sustainable chemistry, uh, and of course, the interaction with industry. Uh, but I'm going to tell you briefly uh, in, about, in a few minutes time about the Committee for Ethics, Diversity, Equity and, Inclu and Inclusion and some of the activities that we have initiated. So IUPAC is a community of volunteers and this picture shows very clearly that we thrive on diversity. These were some of the images taken from our last, last face to face took place in Paris. We partner also with the younger generation. This is so important, the emerging generation. So here is a picture of a group of international younger chemists, the so-called IYCN network. And that network has been an associated organization of IUPAC since 2017. We provide technical and logistical support to aid uh, this group. And a number of IYCN members are active in IUPAC projects. And indeed, they're very energetically involved in the Global Women's Breakfast events. So now I'm going to turn to the impact of women within IUPAC. Finally, after what was close to a century of male leadership, IUPAC has now had two female presidents. On the left, Professor Nicole Moreau from France, who was president in 2010 to 11. And on the right, Professor Natalia Tarasova from Russia, who was president in 2016 and 17. And as well as this, we've had female leadership through the executive director, Dr. Lynn Sobe, who is very shortly to uh, retire from IUPAC. Her successor, who will very shortly be announced, is also a woman. The associate director of IUPAC, shown on the right, is Dr. Fabienne Meyer originally from Belgium, and she looks in particular after conferences, publications and projects. So I'm going to just give you a, a little bit of content about the influence and leadership that this group of stellar women have had on, on IUPAC. Uh, and it was interesting to note when I had a look at the SCGES annual report uh, a couple of weeks ago, that a number of scientific unions reported that the election of women to leadership positions within their organization represented an excellent opportunity to institute policies in favor of diversity. And so IUPAC has been no exception to this trend. Let's have a look at some of the changes. So I explained to you a few minutes ago that the divisions have a group of membership called titular members. Uh, and currently, according to the database, about 36% of current titular members are women. And in fact, 30% of all 
the membership involved in all of the activities are UPAC are female. But if you look at the graph on the right hand side, you'll see that what's interesting is the change in representation of women from 2011, when it was about 12% through now to, to, to 2022, when, as I just said, it is 36%. And I would like to think that, that, that this is in no part, uh, this, that this is certainly in part due to the influence of seeing a woman leader within the organization. Five of our current division presidents are women and two of the next batch uh, uh, of individuals who will become division presidents are female. I referred to earlier that we value geographic diversity as well as gender uh, diversity. And currently the titular members represent 31 different countries. And indeed, if you look at the membership of IUPAC in the database, you discover that they come from 47 different countries. Now, I don't have time to go into detail about the scientific work of IUPAC that it produced. And I've just listed here the titles of some recent uh, projects. And you can take a look at those if you uh, follow through uh, the PDF file of our presentations later on. I've just highlighted here in red that the project for the Global Women's Breakfast series, its creation, and the fact that we incorporated into that the need for a global network in support of eliminating the gender gap in chemistry. So looking across all of the current projects of uh, IUPAC, uh, and I wasn't able to go back and look at figures for 2011 when we had our first female president, but if we compare recent years, so the, the graph here shows 2019, 2021, uh, and data for projects that have been initiated since January 2022. And it's interesting to note that the existing, the earlier project shown here, about one in five of the uh, project leaders have been women. And that reflects in part the fact that these, some of these are quite long established projects. But much more interesting is the fact that the new batch of projects, those recently initiated, more than half of them have in, have a woman as a leader. And I we've also noticed that the recent batch of projects are, are quite diverse in their content and their profile. And I like to think that this reflects the creative input of the women involved. Uh, now, moving along very shortly, uh, Professor Mei Hung Chu uh, will tell us about the Gender Gap in Science project, uh, which she, in which she's involved together with um, Dr. Mark Sasser. So I simply want to let you know that that is supported through the two IUPAC projects, information about which is shown on the screen. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing from Mei Hong. Uh, and as I've referred already, the women's global, the global women's breakfast series is likewise supported um, financially by IUPAC. I, I need to emphasize here that that financial support that we receive for the breakfast is to cover the costs of central design and website costs. And it's not uh, regrettably accessible to support the cost of individual breakfasts. Uh, when Laura was telling us about the origins of the Global Women's Breakfast series back in 2011, she mentioned Marie Curie, the Nobel laureate, and how we were celebrating her accomplishments. And uh, it was quite interesting to me to, to, on a recent visit to IUPAC, to take a look at the archives and to see what role Marie Curie, as a significant woman and a Nobel laureate, had had within the work of IUPAC all those years ago. And she contributed to IUPAC committee work, which in today's language would be project work, back in the 1920s. But if you look at the records, you notice that she's actually named as Ma Madame Pierre Curie, I've highlighted that in blue. She's not identified uh, by her name, Marie Curie. So uh, recognition practices if, have certainly changed. In my own mind, and I think Laura indicated this too, I like to think of Marie Curie as the legacy patron of our Global Women's Breakfast series. Let me move on to tell you about the IUPAC Awards for Distinguished Women in Chemistry and Chemical Engineering. And here's a picture of the award winners from Paris 2019. This is a recognition program which promotes the accomplishments 
and achievement of women chemistry leaders worldwide. And it began in 2011 with a project entitled Are Women Still Underrepresented in Science, which was led by Janet Bryant and Ingrid Montes and sponsored by the American Chemical Society. However, the award program is now funded by IUPAC. I've identified here Carolyn Reeves and Angela Wilson, who have been recent champions for the awards. Now, how are awardees selected? They are, they are selected based on excellence in basic or applied research, accomplishments in teaching or education, demonstrated leadership or managerial excellence in the chemical sciences. And important identifies women with a history of leadership within a chemistry related organization and or community, the chemistry community. So some kind of engagement externally. The 2023 awards uh, opened back in June. Uh, and you'll notice that I've indicated that the nominations for that round of awards closes on November the 1st. So it's probably too late for anybody who's listening who might be interested to nominate for this round, but there will be future rounds uh, and um, please keep a lookout for that. When the awardees have been selected, the, they will be announced on the International Day for Women and Girls in Science, which is on February the 11th and further honored during a chemistry Congress, the World Chemistry Congress in the Netherlands in the middle of next year with an award presentation and a symposium. And I particularly wanted to show you a couple of pictures from the symposia. This was uh, one back in Sao Paulo in 2017. And my Australian colleague, Professor Frances Saparovic, you can see her on the left looking a little bit like a rock star gay plenary lecture at the meeting. But I, what I really wanted to highlight is the picture in the middle where you can see groups of young people uh, uh, enthusiastically talking with Frances after her presentation and after she was profiled through these awards. Women after, afterwards, if they wish to, can provide a, a publication which is submitted to the IUPAC journal, Pure and Applied Chemistry. There have been two special issues highlighting the Distinguished Women Awards. One was back in 2019, and there is currently a volume in press, and I had the very great honour of writing the foreword to that. Uh, and by the way, if you look at the bottom right of the picture, you'll see me with my own award, which I cherish, uh, which I received back in 2013. Now, where do the women come from who have won these awards? Uh, the graph on the left shows you the origin, the region of origin. We've had 82 women representing 29 different countries have now been recognised by this distinctive programme. And, and close to 35% of the winners are from outside of North America and Europe. Naturally, we need to grow this percentage. So please do encourage worthy women from all regions of the globe, but, but particularly from those emerging regions to consider applying in a future round. Well, the final thing that I just want to mention very briefly is by describing our newly established Committee for Ethics, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, CEDEI, which I have the honour of chairing. And I realise that this particular slide is very busy. Uh, so I, we, I, my aim is not for you to read every word that's written on this slide. Um, this is the information that is on the website about the mission of CEDEI, which is to promote and develop the core values that I mentioned before. It is an advisory committee. If you look at the middle of the screen, its role is to provide advice, to recommend best practices and develop policies. And of course, we recognize that many organizations connected to IUPAC already have their own in-house policies. And so this, committee can take a global view, uh, provide leadership to the global chemistry community by collecting examples of best practices, guidelines and recommendations for our own use internally and for the use of the chemistry community. And, and finally, our committee uh, could in principle produce a whistleblower policy, but act as a confidential safe point of contact 
for individuals. Um, and I'm about to show you on the next picture the, the way in which we have um, developed uh, that policy. But I should also mention that we are occasionally asked by the executive, the officers of the union, to provide an independent opinion on any topic related to its mandate, and in particular, to comment on issues of diversity of gender and geography. So the committee was established in 2021. I have the honour of chairing it, and we have a diverse membership. Uh, we are preparing, if you look at the plans and priorities uh, listed here, we're preparing some guidelines for the use by volunteers and staff, when, for example, at conferences, for use in publications, and importantly now in social media posts, now that social media is so much more critical to the way that we transmit and communicate with each other. We're developing an action plan, and naturally that means that we're going to need performance indicators, and I would very much be interested to hear how other scientific unions are, are dealing with this um, to th that we have a conversation about this together. Uh, we may seek some project funding. Uh, a suggested project has been something linked to the principles of good chemistry, which will include uh, statements about ethics and topics, similar topics. And of course, we've been involved in this webinar for the Standing Committee on Gender Equity in Science. An important link that we are going to develop is the interaction with the International Younger Chemists Network with their newly established Diversity and Inclusion Committee. And we hope to share content together. I'm just about at the end of my talk. So I want to just give you a, a final glimpse into the overview of what our committee is about. Uh, earlier was mentioned a whistleblower policy and other policy documents. What we actually currently have are four policy documents listed conflict of interest, one on harassment, which of course clearly covers notably um, behaviour at conferences and in IUPAC related meetings. We have a document on privacy and actual document retention and we have a newly generated document on social media. These five policy documents, together with some umbrella guidelines, are currently awaiting approval by the Bureau and the Council, and this will happen during next year. So against this background, let me state again that IUPAC recognises that the future of chemistry lies in fostering the participation of chemists of all genders and all cultures. That's why I've emphasised the geographic component because this is what leads to creativity and productivity. Uh, this is my final slide. Uh, this is just my own personal view of why all those years ago I joined IUPAC. There have been so many benefits in experiencing IUPAC and other professional organisations. It's been a very rewarding officially to me, but the interactions uh, with, with uh, other colleagues it's personally rewarding to feel that we're contributing to the future of chemistry. So I, I urge those of you, particularly the younger people who may be listening, to think about your own engagement with your own chemical society uh, and international societies that are linked to chemistry. It, it's so much more than line on your CV. So I, I hope that over the last few minutes, what I have explored with you is our uh, fostering of gender equality within its membership and activities. I've described our new committee, I've summarized some of our initiatives, but of course we have to be aware that so much more needs to be done. And IUPAC has the unique uh, role of uh, showing global leadership to the chemistry community, uh, as many jurisdictions, of course, have already uh, diversity policies, but there are jurisdictions worldwide where that, that lack DEI strategies. And so this is where we need to provide support and interaction and to encourage these communities to actively think about these issues and the role of women in STEM. So I'd just like to finish at that point by saying uh, thank you very much. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing the next presentation, which will be that of, of Mei Hung. And so now I'm going to pass back to Dr. Mark Sasa. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Mary. Our last speaker is Professor Mei Hong Chu. Mei Hong is a, is, is a university distinguished professor of science education at the Graduate Institute of Science Education of the National Taiwan Normal University. Currently, she serves as an elected member of the IUPAC Bureau and Executive Committee and as, and as a member of the governing board of the International Science Council. She is co-chair of the IEPAC project that's titled The Gender Gap in Chemistry, Building on the ISC Gender Gap Project. Mei Hong. Okay, um, thanks, Mark. And I also like to take this opportunity to thank the uh, Standing Committee for uh, Gender Equality in Science uh, for having us uh, here. To, uh, present some uh, research results with the uh, uh, participants. So please let me uh, share my uh, slides here. Okay. Okay, so um, it is uh, my great honor and the pleasure to join this uh, webinar. Uh, on gender issues. Uh, today, I'm going to share some results from uh, two studies that is uh, sponsored by uh, IUPAC and uh, co-chaired with uh, Dr. Mark Seiza. Um, I trust all of you are familiar with uh, the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, uh, which was launched in 2015 to aim for achieving uh, the goals in 2030. Among the uh, 17 goals, the number five is the uh, gender equality. So uh, we are halfway to uh, 2030. How far are we now? Uh, how long does it take for us to reach the goal? So uh, basically, um, I'm going to uh, talk about the uh, studies we have done uh, over the past few years. And basically for the uh, first time, seven scientific unions in STEM domains and the four international organizations join together to tackle some issues of the agenda gap. In terms of the uh, interdisciplinary, this has been a unique initiative and cooperative work. Uh, the project was co-led by the uh, International Mathematics, uh, Mathematical uh, Union and the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. With the financial support guaranteed by uh, International Science Council and the uh, project partners over the uh, uh, Trinium uh, 2017 to 2019. As Mary mentioned, uh, we have the, uh, the products from the, uh, the project. Uh, one of the uh, uh, project, uh, one of the achievement is the book with the analysis of our project published in 2020. Based on the findings of the project task and the uh, discussions, the partners have uh, proposed the recommendations for different audiences, uh, including uh, instructors and the parents, uh, scientific or educational organizations of all kinds and the members of the project, which are scientific unions and the worldwide organizations. So uh, what do we mean by gender gap? Uh, the term gender gap refers to any uh, differences uh, between men and the women in terms of their levels of participation, access, rights, remuneration, or benefits. And currently uh, there are uh, fewer than 30% of the world researchers are women. So is there something wrong here? So we try to uh, dig into the data. So uh, here are the uh, people who are involved in this, uh, uh, the first study to do the uh, analysis on the global survey. The global survey of scientists uh, was launched on the 1st of May. Uh, in uh, 2018 and the close on the end of the, the year. And the participants uh, were more than 32,000 respondents to the uh, uh, survey. And the analysis 
were performed on nearly 25,000 responses containing sufficient data from close to 160 centuries. Um, close to uh, 2,700 participants in chemistry across the globe uh, were collected and analyzed in this presentation. Uh, we, uh, we worked with the uh, American uh, Institute of Physics on the uh, air clock insight. And this is a data access protocol that was used to protect the uh, raw data to maintain anonymization. The results of queries through air clock insight de identified the respondents. And this is very important to protect our uh, respondents. So in other words, the results were aggregated and the fully anonymized. So basically for each question, responses were compared by the following uh, three categories. The first one is by gender alone. And the second one is by gender and the human development index geographic region. And the third is the uh, gender and the employment sector, respectively. And what do I mean by the uh, Human Development Index? Um, that, that definition is done by the uh, United Nations. Basically, it is a summary measure of average achievement in key dimensions of human development, a long and a healthy life, being knowledgeable and have a decent standard of the living. So if the uh, HDI equals or greater than 0.7, uh, in our study, we will consider that as a higher level. And if smaller than 0.7, uh, that would be considered as a low level uh, countries or region. And as for the uh, employment sectors, we have the uh, in people employed in academia or in industry. So here are the, uh, uh, the data I'm going to show you. The first one is the, uh, uh, to show the uh, respondents own, own determination to preserve uh, in their studies, as well as their parents, teachers, professors, mentors, uh, ranked the highest. And the women were more likely to say that parents and themselves encouraged them uh, than men. These results were consistent regardless of the HDI level and the employment sector. And the result, uh, the second result I want to share with you is the results showing that more men agreed that their employer treats everyone fairly than women. Also, our study found that respondents in higher HDI regions show less agreement than those in lower level region. And the third data is, uh, sorry. And um, as in report of IV and white, compared with women, more men reported that they progress more quickly than their colleagues who completed uh, their final degrees in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, at the uh, same time. In our extended analysis, this pattern was also seen in higher HDI regions, working in academia and working in industry. So um, we also find something else uh, for this one, uh, the, uh, this table shows you the uh, result by gender and the level of, of uh, HDI. Apparently more men than women had the opportunities to give uh, talks at uh, conferences as invited speakers at both levels of HDI. This pattern was also seen for the op opportunities to serve as an editor of journal at a higher HDI level and for opportunities to be elected to positions of leadership of uh, scholarly associations at the uh, lower FDI level. It is noticeable 
that in the lower HDI region, more women had the opportunities to serve as editors of journal or to serve on the board of directors. And then uh, we also find uh, we also find that uh, more women than men indicated that their career or rate of promotion had a slowed uh, had slowed uh, significantly because they had become uh, apparent. The response was similar to the findings of IV and white. Um, this pattern was also apparent in both levels of HDI and the employment sector. Particularly, there were two noticeable uh, large, large gender differences. No men indicate significantly slower promotion in lower HDI region, and more than twice as many women working in academia indicates a significantly longer time to promotion. So we uh, keep looking at the data whether or not there are gender differences among uh, between the HDI regions. This uh, slide shows you um, more men than women uh, indicate that their work or career didn't change significantly after they had become apparent. So in our study, this pattern can also be observed in both levels of HDI regions and the lower levels of um, lower levels show a relatively high percentage in both genders. So by employment uh, sectors, there existed gender differences only in participants working in academia. So uh, basically, the, uh, I would like to use this uh, slide to summarize the uh, uh, conclusions for the first study. Uh, basically, we found the uh, females more females uh, indicate that they receive parents' encouragement and own determination. Their career choices had greater influence in their long-term relationships, and uh, their career was influenced more significantly by parenthood. And they do not seem to have sufficient opportunity to be recognized in scientific areas and to provide equal opportunities. And finally, Finally, uh, it showed the uh, slower rate of publication and the promotion. So that's, uh, and in general, these results were also seen in both higher and the lower HDI regions and in all employment, employment sectors, except that similar percentage of men and women working in industry indicate their career didn't change significantly after they become, became uh, parents. So that's the first part. Uh, of the study. And the second part of the study is mainly about whether or not we have a good practices in chemistry to promote gender equality. And I have these uh, cooperators uh, working together. Uh, so today I'm going to show you some of the uh, findings. And basically uh, we, um, a systematic review have, uh, has been done uh, comparing to the uh, tra traditional systematic review, the uh, present study is not done with the uh, different publications and the papers, but more is based on the uh, homepage uh, and the other resources, which might show the, uh, uh, the spirit of the program. So uh, fifth, uh, we use some keywords to identify the programs that we want to analyze. So 52 programs were identified for this presentation. And we have uh, three research questions. The first one is, what are the uh, strategies over the different projects aiming to close the gender gap in chemistry? Uh, the second one is, which goals are followed within the name to offer the activities? And the, um, the third, what can be described as a potential impact or outcomes of the named offers. So um, 12, um, in, in general, uh, it was possible to identify um, 10 different activities and the strategies offered by different projects uh, we reviewed in the uh, present uh, study. And here, 
is to say that some projects used to offer different activities to achieve the goals. For instance, here, 12 of the project over, uh, offered a one-day conference or workshop, especially for girls. Following these conferences and the symposia exclusively for women uh, are made in the past. And causes of the exclusive of the uh, uh, IUPAC Global Women, uh, Women's uh, Breakfast uh, is named uh, separately. However, it is also calculated in the uh, one day offer. And showing the uh, recognition of the work of the women, nine out of the uh, reviewed projects are over, uh, offering the awards, uh, honoring the work of uh, uh, women in chemistry. So as you can see, these are the distribution of the activities. And the second one, to answer the uh, second research questions, this table shows you that the uh, main goals for 17 projects out of uh, 52, that means about uh, one third of the uh, projects were one of the followings. The first one, engage girls and the young women in STEM primary and the secondary education as well as the in te technical and the vocational education and the training. And the uh, second one is promoting uh, gender equality in career progression. And, and the last one, promoting the uh, gender dimension in research uh, content, practice, and the, uh, sorry, and the uh, agenda. So, Few projects addressed all more than one of these uh, goals. For instance, I'm uh, taking three examples uh, for you to uh, see what we mean uh, by the, uh, the uh, good practices. The first one is um, the uh, Women in Chemistry from Nigeria. Uh, it is a division of the uh, Chemical Society of uh, Nigeria that was established in 2015. Its vision is uh, fostering networking, mentoring, and the cooperation among female chemists in Nigeria for their pro uh, professional development. This vision is similar to goals number four, promote uh, gender equality in career progression, and the number seven, promote gender equality in science and the technology-based um, innovation uh, together. And the second case is the uh, AFIK in academia, an Israel, uh, Israeli uh, Women uh, Professors Association may serve as an example of a project which goals are one, building female leadership. Second, empowering future female researchers in Israeli un universities. The third, Increase the awareness of gender gaps among decisions and the policy, un, university policymakers. And number four, achieving rate equality of participation for female researchers in commi uh, committees. So this would fit into our goals number one, four, six, and seven. And the last example is coming from the Society of Taiwan Women in science and the technology. And this association tries to uh, achieve the following goals. The first one is to build female leadership and the role models while producing videos of their achievement and giving awards. And the second one is promoting gender equality in career progression. And the third, promoting uh, gender equality in science and the technology-based uh, innovation. So this society is not only to build the network in Taiwan, but also to make connections in Asia via hosting regional conferences, such as the Asia, such as the Asia uh, and the Pacific uh, Nation Nation Network meetings in 2020. So in summary, here, as you can see, if uh, um, uh, if a program is recognized locally, and it is very likely to get the uh, institutional support, 
And also if it is worthwhile continue, normally the uh, association or the uh, chemical society will give them the support and that let them to be sustainable. So we also look at the programs in terms of the uh, local and the global impact. And as you can see here, 30 out of 52 are uh, with the uh, institutional support. And the luck, uh, we were also fortunately to see 23 out of 52 have the uh, continuity. So they could hold their conferences or events on, on a regular uh, basis. So from what we saw here, there are four areas uh, that we could take the actions. The first one is to provide the uh, mentor women scientist programs. The second one is opportunities of leadership position. The third one is nominating women for awards. And the last one is inviting women uh, speakers uh, and the moderators to, be, uh, to let them recognized and visible. So the last uh, section, I will briefly just talking about the uh, gender equality and the education. And I think the education is very, very important. So I have a couple of messages to send out. The first one is coming from this uh, uh, study. The study was done uh, over the uh, 1.5 million gender identified authors. Uh, their publication uh, and uh, their pu publishing career ended between 1955 and uh, 2010, covering 83 countries and the 13 disciplines. Um, there, the uh, graph uh, I show you here, there is a strong correlation implies that disciplines or countries with a large gender difference in the uh, career length also have a large gender differences in total uh, productivity. While those disciplines or countries with smaller gender differences in the career length also have a small gender difference in total productivity. So let's uh, look at the uh, uh, examples here. Um, the uh, gender gap in career length is smaller in applied physics, uh, as so is the uh, gender gap in total productivity. In contrast, in biology and the chemistry, men have 19.2% uh, uh, longer career on average, uh, resulting in a, a total productivity uh, gender gap and exceeds, and exceeds a 35.1. And if you look at the uh, uh, chemistry and the biology, uh, basically men have uh, you know, the longer uh, careers and compared to the, uh, the men, the, the women. So um, the second uh, point I also like to address is we talk about the uh, professors might, be, might play the role as the uh, mentor for the uh, young generation. But according to the study, it says, we always think um, in order to reduce the uh, gender gap, the scientific community must uh, take efforts to nurture junior female researchers. However, uh, they also found that the academic system is losing women at a higher rate at every stage of their careers, suggesting that focusing on junior sci scientists alone may not be sufficient to reduce the observed career-wise gender imbalance. So there are several um, issues that we also need to look into that and try to find the reason behind the phenomena and uh, try to find the appropriate actions to take. And as we know, the uh, Nobel Prize was launched in 1901, and by now it has been uh, more than 100 years. If you look at the statistics here, there, uh, there were only uh, four female physics awarded, and for the chemistry, there were seven. Uh, there were seven in total. So there is a long way to go and we should create a more healthy and uh, inclusive uh, uh, environment to help the uh, female scientists to have a good environment to work on their study. 
So since this session is mainly to talk about the, uh, um, the education. So I think basically we want to nurture in a more diverse and inclusive STEM uh, community via education. So not only to provide the opportunity of learning science for all, I think we also need to raise the awareness of gender equality in academia and the industry not only for men, but also not only for women, but also for men. So uh, taking the uh, Mandela's word, education is the most powerful uh, weapon which you can use to change the world. So we also need to encourage girls to study in STEM. So um, the, this would be um, maybe the second last one. And Mary also already mentioned that. And Mark and I uh, co-edited this uh, special issue on gender gap in science. And there are six uh, uh, articles uh, included. Uh, I, I thought I would like to share this uh, uh, information with you in case you are interested. So at the last, I would like to thank all the uh, cooperators uh, to work on the uh, study. And I also like to thank IUPAC for supporting this project. So thank you very much for your listening. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mei Hong, and thanks to all of our speakers uh, today. I'd like to ask all of the speakers, please, to turn on your uh, microphones and, and uh, cameras. And uh, we'll begin to take questions uh, through the chat. So for those of you in attendance on YouTube, if you have a question, uh, please enter it into the YouTube chat function and we'll try to get to it as soon as we can. Okay. First is a question for Mary. What organizations did the work that showed the trend of decreasing women in the chemistry field? Mary? Ah, thank you very much, Mark. I hope people can hear me. The internet yes. connection here has turned out to be a little unstable. Uh, I'm looking at the chat box. The question you want me to answer is the one about did the, which organisation did the work? Correct. Correct. OK. Um, well, it was published in an Australian Academy of Science report, but I think that the actual source of the data uh, was from uh, a report, I don't know if it was United Nations, to do with the recent International Day for Girls. There was quite a lot of publicity about this during the latter part of September, but the actual source of my information uh, was through an Australian Academy report. Um, I know that we've got Frances Saparovich actually listening to this webinar, so if she can provide any more information um, she could perhaps uh, pop that into the YouTube chat uh, channel. Uh, otherwise, I can certainly afterwards uh, forward the, the source of that. But my information was it was quite widely shared international, internationally. It's, it's depressing, isn't it, that after all of these years of activity and uh, encouragement that the trend of decreasing women and of course, it wasn't just in the field of chemistry. It's 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 depressing, isn't it, that after all these years, uh, it seems to be going um, backwards, not increasing. Mark, you're muted, by the way. Thanks. Hey, another question. When looking at the discrepancy in award winners between men and women, do you think the larger challenge is in getting more women nominated or in addressing any impact bias in selection committees? This question is used for Mary or Laura, I guess. Yeah, my experience from a, a relatively narrow number of organizations that I've been involved with um, is that, you know, with respect to awards, women are less likely to think that they should not be nominated 
for awards. They, they generally feel that they are not quite there or they want to wait another year or um, don't quite see themselves as fitting all the criteria for an award. Um, and, and so I think fewer women are nominated. And then, you know, it's hard to say as far as the uh, award uh, panels, but um, I think it has been shown that, uh, you know, two resumes, one you know, that are identical, one with a woman's name and one with a, a man's name will be uh, rated differently um, and not, and women won't be given as much credit uh, for their qualifications. And so um, I think that uh, that also plays a role, unfortunately. Mary? Um, I might just add to that, that I think that some award nominations ha still regrettably have a criteria that is age related, an award that might be given, for example, to somebody under the age of 40. So if a, a person were to have their PhD at the age of 25, they would have 15 years worth of experience. But if they get their PhD at the age of 30, and of course, many women will take longer to, to get to their PhD, uh, and not just for family related reasons, they will only have 10 years. So that there's a that there's a competitive issue there that has to be uh, addressed. And that's going to be one of the things that we will be looking at in relation to all of IUPAC's awards uh, in the uh, immediate uh, future. Okay, thanks, Laura and Mary. Are there any other questions? Here's one, IUPAC has been doing several things to support women in the field. Which activities do you think have been the most impactful? This question is for all of our speakers, I think. Laura, do you want to go first and then I'll come in behind you? Sure, or Mayhung, do you have any thoughts on that from your perspective? And you can unmute yourself. Okay, um, I thought this uh, question is very interesting because um, uh, it's so obvious for Laura <laughs> uh, because of the uh, women uh, breakfast that has uh, quite a lot of uh, inferences. Uh, but I also like to say um, it's uh, all the activities conducted by IUPAC has uh, quite a lot of uh, impact uh, in many ways. For instance, uh, back to 2011, that was the uh, international year of chemistry. During that year, um, there were 80,000 Brazilian kids joined the uh, water experiment. So they tested the uh, quality of the water in their regions and they compared the data and they you know, tried to find out why the uh, quality of the water is so, so poor and uh, how could we improve the quality of the water. So in terms of the, uh, the impact, I think this is the, uh, the impact to the students who really, I mean, the issue is really uh, tied to their daily life. And back to uh, 2019, IUPAC also has the uh, periodical table uh, to, uh, to distribute it, uh, to have the uh, elements challenge and a lot of uh, NAO, national adhering uh, organizations launched a lot of activities locally. And that also bring the people's awareness about how chemistry influences their life and how much chemistry can do for sustainable development. So, um, and then now we can see the, uh, the, um, the uh, this year, you know, uh, we are talking about the uh, Global Women's uh, Breakfast uh, to extend the impact from IUPAC chemist, chemist to other unions. So I just think IUPAC has a lot of uh, uh, initiatives that have uh, impact uh, uh, in many places, not only local, but also globally. So um, it's very difficult. It's a big challenge for me to pick up one. I just think all the vol volunteers are great. They make the uh, students to appreciate 
chemistry is everywhere and they could do something to make the earth better and uh, sustainable. So that's it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I would say with respect to supporting women in the field, um, of course, we can always do much more. But I, I would say that definitely the global breakfast and the, the, the prominence and priority that IUPAC has given to the global breakfast, the amount of visibility that has uh, been raised with respect to this uh, project within the union. I think now people are within the organization are just much more aware and more cognizant of, of needing to be more balanced from a gender perspective. And I think there's just sort of a, a, a much more diverse um, set of voices that now feel empowered to speak up about these topics, uh, where in the past, maybe that wasn't as welcome. Um, and, uh, and I'm really excited with you know the new century of IUPAC, uh, where we're going to go because I I think we're on a good path and uh, but but we definitely need to continue improving and also I think IUPAC can be quite influential on other organizations around the world to adopt you know similar practices. I might just uh, chip in behind Laura and of course you would expect me to say that the Global Women's Breakfast has had a significant impact but I'd also I think like to highlight um, the connection that we made with the International Younger Chemists Network because that generation of emerging chemistry researchers and leaders are naturally aware of this as an issue and outward uh, looking and thinking about it. And so the, the interactions that we have with that, with that group, I think have, have, been, have already shown a significant amount of benefit to IUPAC and will continue to do in the future. So uh, this also, I think, represents uh, the way forward. All of our activities, I hope that I tried to show that all of our activities have been um, impactful. Uh, and, uh, you know, what a blessing it was in 2010 when we finally, after all of those years of male leadership, uh, ha celebrated having our very first female president of IUPAC. Thanks, folks. Any other questions? Um, Mark, could I add something? Sure. Yeah, OK. Um, and I think I would like to add one more um, impact. That is the uh, Global Gender uh, uh, Gap Project. Because as I uh, mentioned that it was the first time to have so many unions working together to find out what the problems uh, or what the uh, uh, actions has been done. And uh, it's just, uh, I, I would say it's a, just a legend to have so many uh, scientists working together and to look at these uh, problems seriously. And after uh, three years project, the, uh, S, uh, the standing committee uh, for gender, uh, gender equality in science, this committee was established after this uh, uh, project. So I think that's a, a very important thing, uh, not only to conduct a study, but also building up a network of scientists. So I think we, uh, IUPAC also makes some uh, contribution in this aspect. And it is really a privilege to work with so many outstanding scholars on this project. So I, I just think I also like to take this opportunity to thank all the uh, uh, participants yeah, for the project. Thanks, Michael. Any other questions? Well, we've heard a lot today about a variety of initiatives that IUPAC is doing. I'm wondering among the audience if any of these initiatives have resonated with you, or if you have any suggestions on things that IUPAC could be doing or other unions as well, or other organizations. Yeah, that would be good to hear if they if they have any suggestions for us on how to improve what we're doing.
Well, in particular, we're really encouraging other other unions and other people from other sciences to to be a part of the Global Women's Breakfast in 20, 2023. What a great initiative that is. Really looking forward to it. <clears throat> exactly. I think that um, it, this new international year of basic sciences for sustainable development um, is wonderful because it does reach across so many areas of science. And uh, we, we're privileged to be a partner with that international year. And as I showed in my talk, each uh, the International Year of Chemistry and the International Year of the Periodic Table has really been a catalyst for, uh, for this uh, gender diversity issue uh, and, and making improvements. So we're hoping for a really big year uh, in 2023 and seeing all types of science organizations joining, joining the breakfast. Okay, thanks, Laura. Um, we have a question here. Can you tell people how they can send suggestions after the webinar? Um, I'll, I guess I'll open that up to the folks from SCGES that are on the call. Uh, maybe Catherine could answer that question or um, to help um, out with yes, the um, Yes, you need to go to the SCGES website and then there's a contact form there and you can write to us and we will definitely get back to you. Okay. The uh, SCGES uh, website, um, not difficult to remember the address is gender-equality-in-science.org. Okay, and also remind folks, thank you, Catherine, that uh, we'll, this, this session is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. And you may want to take a look at it later and submit suggestions as Catherine has suggested. People have suggestions for IUPAC, where can they send those suggestions? I would say the best place right now would be to send it to the Global Breakfast email account as globalbreakfast at iupac.org. And uh, I can put that also in the YouTube chat um, for people. But that, that email address is monitored uh, daily. And so if you have any suggestions, uh, not just about the Global Breakfast, but anything else, you can certainly send them to that email and it'll get forwarded to the right person. Great. Good idea, Laura, thanks. Okay, here's a question. I attended a Femex meeting where 70% female and fewer male attendees were there, which had, um, which, which made for exp much experiences for both genders. Thank you, Sherry Sue, for that comment. Yeah, Mark, it's Mary here. I, th I think sure. that's, that's it's an interesting comment because uh, I don't know about other breakfasts. I go to the Global Breakfast in Brisbane and we have a, a large number of young male students who come and they come understanding that the purpose of the breakfast is to celebrate women and they they positively engage with that. Um, so I think the the sense of as Laura talked about, of working together with male allies uh, is a very productive one. And I think that, you know, we should not make any of this activity women exclusive. That's not what this is about at all. It's about greater recognition. And that comes from both genders being involved in the conversation. Uh, and I think that, that the one of the reasons why the breakfasts are successful is could it provides an informal environment in which you can have that sort of conversation uh, and also I'll just also finish by uh, Laura set up a committee uh, in which we actually have a group of men working with some women to actually try and uh, think about how we might grow that participation by men in the global women's breakfast series so I think that that this could be something for other organizations to think about as well Thanks, Mary. Any other comments or questions from our audience today?
Okay, well, not seeing any. Uh, thank you very much to everyone who has attended our, our webinar today for SEGES. Uh, thanks again to all of our speakers, Laura McConnell, Mary Garson, Mei Hung Chu, for some excellent talks and some really provocative um, and exciting things that IEPAC is doing. Um, I hope you've all found that uh, uh, informative and useful and maybe to take a few suggestions back with you when you go back to uh, your own organizations or unions or places of employment. Uh, once again, just like to mention that this uh, webinar will be available for viewing on the YouTube channel and the talks will be available on the SCGES website very shortly. So, um, Catherine, would you have any closing remarks? Um, I would just like to thank um, IUPAC and the four of you for this very interesting opportunity to see how uh, effectively the international union that represents a profession worldwide can actually uh, be quite proactive in uh, promoting women in science. And I think this can also be an inspiration in other scientific disciplines um, that have joined the um, Standing Committee for Gender Equality in Science. So thank you again. Okay. Again, thanks everyone for attending. We appreciate your being here. And thanks again to all of our speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, have thank a good you day, for having folks. Us. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.